Alright, well, why don't we open with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank and praise you. You have blessed us through your Son. Help us, Lord, to partake of the living bread so that we can take courage in the world around us to not be afraid, but instead to be bold and courageous, not only with your word, but with the understanding of your word as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so, as I said, we're going to start off on this, and uh, I'm actually not starting you at the beginning. He has a couple chap, not a couple chap, a couple sections, I'll call it, um, things that are labeled for such a time as this, which I would normally share with you, but it's really... Oh. I think less relevant to the whole book. And so it's more, it's more like, why did I write this book type of thing instead of what this book is about. And so instead we're going to start with, why are you so afraid? Do you guys realize you're afraid? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So keep in mind, this book was written right after the pandemic. And I would say it does kind of play into today, though, still. And when we're talking about this fear, why are we so afraid, it... it really speaks to our faith. Fear can and should be a trust issue. We're going to explain how it can be good or bad, okay? So perhaps a good issue or a bad issue. But we're going to start off, and so if you've got your little hand out there, I'm going to, we're just going to kind of read through it. And so um, when I'm reading, especially a book like this, Instead of waiting until I get to a stopping point, if you have a question, just interrupt because it's easier to talk about it while it's on your mind and it doesn't bother me. So just interrupt with the question. We'll talk about it. And then I've got some questions built in to, into my book. You guys don't have them, but in my book I have some questions built in. Um, and so we'll kind of go, it's, it's going to be kind of more of a dialogue. <laughs> as we're going through. So we're kind of dialoguing with the text. Yes. Do you have questions built in? And did you put them in there or is there a study guide? No, there is no study guide. Yeah, in fact, in fact, I looked. I, I actually looked several different ways and times to try to find like a study guide for this. You think, because our synod likes, you know, study guides and stuff. So you'd think someone would have put one together, whether CPH or a church or something like that. And nope. Nothing showed up online off of multiple searches, so... So yeah. write legibly because you can be published. Oh, say, uh -huh. say it again. Write. write legibly because you could be published. I could be published, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, and well, normally, you know, I've done those little sheets and stuff, and as I said, the reason why I, I went back to the books is because as I was doing the sheets, or actually what I was really thinking about doing was doing like a PowerPoint thing, I was like, well, I'll just put this text on the PowerPoint. I'll put this, and so I, I literally scanned the first like quarter of the book, and then I'm like, this is ridiculous. I, I, I should I should just have them have a book in their hands, you know. So yes, this is the right thing to do. It's right. Yeah. So, somebody can't afford one and needs one. We'll Yeah, and what's what's really funny too about these is. This is the first book I've found from CPH where it's actually cheaper on CPH than it is on Amazon. Isn't that <laughs> That's a sign it's going out of print. Well, it's a sign that CPH does group discounts and Amazon doesn't. But uh, it's funny because it's, it's $18 if you buy it as a single copy from CPH. And then they do discounts for 10 or more copies. Um, Amazon, their digital version okay. that you can buy on Kindle is $18. Huh. But if you want the print book, then it's $20. Wow. Which I find kind of interesting. That's because they have to mail it. You can't email it. I guess, yeah. I think it's, that's kind of wild that it's $18 for the Kindle version. Yeah. yeah. I mean, usually you can get that stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. So why are you so afraid? Fear is pervasive. Day and yesterday. After his sin, Adam was afraid of God and said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Genesis 3.10. Sarah denied laughing because she was afraid. Genesis 18.15. 
Jacob was afraid of God, Genesis 28, 16 through 17. Of Laban, Genesis 31, 31. And of Esau, Genesis 32, 7. Joseph's brothers were afraid of him, Genesis 43, 18. Moses was afraid of God, Exodus 3, 6. And so were the Israelites, Exodus 20, verse 18. When Moses' face was shining, having been in the presence of God, the Israelites were afraid to look at his face too, Exodus 34, 30. The Israelites were afraid of the Philistines, 1 Samuel 7, 7, and the other inhabitants of the land of Canaan. When God brought his people back from exile, they were again afraid of the inhabitants of the land, Ezra 4, verse 4. The story is the same throughout the New Testament. Before we dive into the New Testament, though, is everyone familiar with all these stories? Because yes. when you think about it, like think about all these different account encounters, right? The sin of Adam and Eve, right? This is the creation of our separation with God, right? Right. Fear of the Almighty, fear of a holy, perfect God, and we think we better cover ourselves up because we're afraid. It's also the cause of the first death in the Bible. Because after Adam and Eve sinned, God at least acquired leather from somewhere, right? He acquired skins. And so it appears that God himself killed the first thing in the Bible as a result of sin. The animals. The animals, yeah, yeah. Okay? But then the first murder, I mean, what, about human death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the sin of, yeah. of Cain and Abel. Yeah. And they didn't even do this one. But what was Cain afraid of? Why he committed the murder? What was he afraid well, of? no, after the murder. Oh, after the murder. That he was going to be, that the other people on the earth. Yeah, were that they were, that they were going to take vengeance on him, right? Yeah, rightfully so. He just killed your brother, right? You know, but that's the whole mark of Cain and all this stuff. Yeah, it's it's a result of fear and God providing courage in the midst of fear, even for the first murderer. Okay. That it looked like if there hadn't been any sin, there wouldn't be any fear either. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you think about that, without sin, there's no need to fear the holy, okay? And so how does that relate to us? Well, if you go into the realm of Christ and his righteousness, right, we are clothed sinless. Adam and Eve were clothed with death. We are clothed with Jesus' death, right? And so our sin has been atoned for. Okay? All right. Um, oh, another one, Jacob. Jacob was afraid of God in Genesis 28, 16 through 17, of Laban in 31, 31, of Esau in 32, 7. You know, all these different times demonstrate that Jacob was also coming to an appreciation of his God as well. In fact, let's turn to that first one, Genesis 28, 16 through 17. And what's just happened? Genesis 28, 16 through 17. Yep. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place! There is none other than the house of God. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Okay. So, question What was he afraid of? I mean, this seems like a good encounter, right? I mean, come on. Stairway to heaven, uh, angels ascending and descending. What is he afraid of? It doesn't make him any less a sinner. It doesn't make him any less a sinner. And God's just given him a promise. What did God say? Back up a few verses. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. 
Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And that's also the promise he gave Abraham. Yeah. He just got the messianic promise, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it made him afraid. Okay? It made him afraid. And in holy fear, this is the turning point in the Jacob saga. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the trickster, right? He's doing things according to his own ways and means, and he's kind of manipulating God's promises to get his own way. You know, he's doing all this stuff. This, from this point forward, things start happening to Jacob instead of Jacob starts doing things towards others. Okay? And then after this, after this final thing, you get this, uh, this Esau encounter in Genesis 32-7. Right around this same time is when... Jacob remarks, I left this land and crossed this Jordan with nothing but the staff in my hand. I come back, and thanks to you, God, I have droves and encampments and flocks and herds and, and 11 kids. You know, he, he, he leaves with nothing. He comes back with everything. Why? Because of God's promise and the fear he had in God. Yeah. Okay? All right, so let's keep going. The story is the same throughout the New Testament. Zechariah was afraid of the angel, as was Mary. Uh, Luke 1, 13 and Luke 1, 30. After Jesus orchestrated a miraculous catch of fish, Peter fell to his knees afraid. When they believed their lives were in peril from a great windstorm and big waves, the disciples in the boat were afraid. Later, after Jesus stilled the storm with the word, they were filled with fear, wondering who it was whom wind and sea would obey. Mark 4, 37-41. When they saw Jesus walking on water, the disciples were terrified. Matthew 14, 26. When Peter walked out to Jesus and saw the wind, he was afraid. Verse 30. Peter, James, and John were terrified at Jesus' transfiguration. Mark 9, verse 6. The disciples were afraid to ask Jesus the meaning of his prediction of his death and resurrection in Mark 9, 32. The Easter gospel ends, and they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid in Mark 16, verse 8. Um, I actually still claim that that was the original ending of Mark. I know that's not necessarily universally held. Um, but I still say that was the ending of Mark. Yeah, and after that, I think what we have past those verses, I think, was probably a, a, a someone else adding a, an addendum or a sermon or something like that. That's my personal opinion. Fear, especially among disciples, was exceedingly common. Today, fear is all too common among Christians. What do we fear today? question for you. What do we fear today? If it's so exceedingly common, even among Christians, what do we fear? I think rejection. Rejection of what? If you try to share the gospel with somebody, you're afraid they're going to throw it back in your face. Or okay. Just... Fear of rejection of sharing the gospel? Yeah. Well, I think that a large part of mankind is afraid of what the future holds as far yes. as warfare and stuff like that. Yeah. What does the future hold for warfare? Yeah. Future holds for our children. Yeah, for our children. Now, there was an interesting little Facebook post that I shared talking about how you know parents are often afraid of the world their children is going into, and yet the biblical testimony is God prepares the generation for what they're going to encounter. Mm -hmm. Esther, mm -hmm. you know, Mordecai. Uh, you look at Daniel, Meshach, uh, Shadrach, and Abednego. All of, they were prepared for what they would encounter. I guarantee you their parents didn't want them to deal with those things, but yet God prepared them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's some other fears? Someone, the you... Loss of very loved family and friends. Yeah. Fear mm -hmm. of loss, of not being able to be around them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I think there's fear, too, of things like, am I really sure about this heaven stuff? Okay. Is there re Did I get this right? Did I get this right? <laughs> oh. Yeah. I think, I uh, I'm sorry. I think Christians fear in certain areas especially, and even beginning in our nation, persecution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the first sign of the fish was fear. Yeah. We fear it so much that we're willing to change the entire foundation of our country to avoid it. Ironic, since our country was founded on the idea of, yeah. of avoiding it from a different method, right? Yeah. You know, the entire Christian nationalism mm -hmm. is, a con is a concept of changing the country to be a Christian country so that you don't have to fear reprisal. That's that's Christian nationalism. That's not that's not our founding fathers, right? Our founding fathers was freedom of religion, not freedom, you know, from other religions, you know. Hmm. Yeah, that's it's a fear attack. Who defines Christian nationalism? So I'm using the the definition of Christian nationalism that in, that basically implies that the goal of Christian nationalist is to make a country that is a theocracy, a country that is based upon governance by the Bible and biblical morals and standards, and that therefore, essentially, it's more advantageous to be a Christian than to not be a Christian. And that, of course, is not freedom of religion. Yeah, it's not. No. I, I, I would just venture to say, don't let the world define what something is. Uh, when I hear the term Christian nationalism, I'm going to define it by my own standards, and they're pretty high. But actually, that's what the founding fathers had in mind. Not to be ruled by the church, but all of that foundation that was set was the Bible <clears throat> for our government. No. <clears throat> well, no. not like... It was, our, our, our nation was founded not on biblical principles, but <clears throat> on enlightenment. Well, that's true too, morality. Yeah. morality, yeah. 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 And so the Enlightenment <laughs> principles was the entire concept that we have certain inalienable rights. Guess what? The Bible never gives us rights. Jesus never declared you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In fact, Jesus blatantly told you you would not have those things. Huh. Yeah. And so, no, we are not founded as a Christian nation. We are founded as an enlightenment nation. So when it says on our coins, in God we trust. Which was not a founding saying. Not, not only that, that but Christians. it's not Christian. That's only yeah. deist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a deist saying, meaning that there is a supreme being, and that supreme being has, you know, a, an a allegiance <laughs> or governance that we, that we should Submit to was, or whatever. I yeah. Told it, I don't know how true it is. That, that was added to our money and to our pledge during the Cold War to kind of root out who was communist. communist. And who was not. Because communists are atheists. And they can't say yeah. that they have even a deistic faith. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's not the coins that you're talking about. But yeah, that was Pledge of Allegiance. But yeah. 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 So that being said, are the Enlightenment principles that drastically different from the biblical principles? No, for the most part, other than the very central tenet. Enlightenment is based upon human wisdom and knowledge and definition of okay. truth. Okay. In other words, enlightenment says that I am, or I think, therefore I am, right? The center of knowledge, the center of revelation, is the person, That's really not God. Mm -hmm. That's so the foundation of the Enlightenment. Has it produced all sorts of wonderful things? Sure, sure. It's a good foundation to build upon, but you have to recognize what it has changed. It's no longer basing things on God. It's basing things on humanity. Well, that's the foundation of all whole main religions. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you think about it, yeah. and this is exactly what you're saying. In our country, we say you can have any religion. Our religion does not say that. 
our religion says if you have some other religion, you are wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Sure, that's not the American way. The American way is to say, oh, well, have any religion you want. It's fine. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Have a good day. It just gives you and so, so think about it this way. When back, I'm going to circle us all the way back to Christian nationalism. What is then the issue with Christian nationalism? This is a rhetorical question. The issue is that you are no longer evangelizing the good news. You are proclaiming the law. Which is the good news. In that religion. In that religion, in that, yeah. In that and so Christian nationalism says that God's law is, is the means of conversion. You're going to, by law and decree, force people to be a Christian. I don't think they're doing that in this country. I think, Not right now, no, but I guarantee you there's many that would say that. that I think that term was cooked up by the godless heathens, Christian nationalism, to smear good people who love their Lord first and then love their country. It, might, it may have been cooked up by them, but they're not the only ones using it. Is the but problem. it's to repress the Christians. Yeah. They don't want them to be involved with politics. You know, to take your smear us your and, church somewhere yeah. else. So here's the question. We're, we're so far. Yeah, that, no, no, no. Let's get away. Here's, the, here's the question. That's good. Yeah, here's the question. How then do you enforce morality if you don't mandate morality? Yeah, good. Good point. How did Jesus enforce morality? Most of our laws are based on the Bible. No, no. How did Jesus enforce morality? He didn't. He started with trust. In other words, the law should be our response to the gospel. In other words, once you yourself know that you're forgiven and free from the law, what should your natural response be? To do the law. To go do the law. Exactly. And so if you want everyone to, if you want this to be a Christian nation, then the only way is to make everyone a Christian yep. first. Yep. That his kingdom is not of the world. Yeah. It can't be done through legislation. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so that's right. that's right. the right. difference. And we don't. I'll be honest. I don't think we have this problem in the Lutheran Church per se. Yes, there are various people and tenants. You know that that's part of it. But I would say the the bigger organizations that have issues with this are. To be fair, some of the evangelical Christians who are more concerned and fearful of the law saying something is possible than they are of talking to the individual and sharing the gospel with that individual. Okay? And the distinct difference there is this end, the end result in theory is the same, right? But the difference is how are you getting there? Are you getting there by force? Or are you getting there by conversion? Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, don't, this country was founded on that principle that the government cannot force you to believe in a certain religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to stay out of it. So yeah. And why? Are saying they want that because of fear, right? Yeah. So all the way full circle, right? Our foundations, the reason the enlightenment principles that we have are there is because of the fear of the opposite. Their fear was that the government would say everyone has to be this religion or that religion, and you couldn't have freedom of worship or freedom of practice or anything like that. To be honest, they had that and they experience. Had that. <laughs> and they had that experience. They have reason to fear it, right? <laughs> so then how is that any different than the so-called Christian nationalism? That's different because now we're in charge. Now the Christians are in charge. <laughs> the Christians are tired of being... Uh, persecuted, so yeah. we'll just change the government to where we persecute everybody else. How's that? <laughs> Harris, it isn't different, John. I would argue it isn't different, and I would argue that our forefathers were inherently sinful to do what they did. Yeah. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you you have the freedom to choose your own government. Of course not. That was her sin. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the strange thing about that means that we as a nation exist because our forefathers sinned against their God-given authority. Now, you know, here's the other, here's the other follow-on. The king was also sinning against the people, right? 
Because <laughs> the Bible does tell quite a bit to the government about what the government should and shouldn't be doing. And so because we live in a sinful, broken world, the hard part is how do you balance which sin do you deal with? Do you deal with the sin of the tyrant, or do you deal with the sin of the people? I, I got one for you, and this we'll get in the weeds a little bit here. Once upon a time, four, or five, six years ago, Rush Limbaugh used to always define freedom as the love between the Lord our God for us and our love for Him. Mm -hmm. That was the ultimate, to, to his way of thinking, yes. was the ultimate definition of freedom. Yeah, that would, want to I would see, well, that's the gospel, right? <laughs> you know, the gospel makes us free. That's, I mean, they, without that, we have no freedom. And now here's the, here's the thing, it's always freedom from. Freedom from sin, right? Not freedom for ourselves. Because what does freedom from sin do? It chains us to the gospel. It chains us to Christ. Okay. And so uh, Luther liked to use the term, you have a bound will. You are you know, chained, bound uh -huh. to sin, or you are chained, bound to Christ. Mm -hmm. There is no unchanged state for humanity. Right. You're either chained to the devil or you're chained to Christ. There is no unchained state. Why? Because no matter what, you're still a creature. Yeah. And so if you're a creature who is freed from sin, well, then that makes you a creature who is part of what the Creator intended you to be. Yeah. Okay? Uh, same if you're a creature who is following what your Creator told you to do and what to be, etc., well, then... Yeah. You don't get the choice of following Satan. But St. Right? Paul said that we're wretched men because we're, we're in a dual society, godliness and sinfulness, and we're, we're torn yeah. as we go through life. Mm -hmm. We want to go towards the Lord more and more, but we're still, yeah. oh, wretched man am I. Yeah, what is that song? Um, uh, my chains are free or... Uh, oh. Yeah, my chains are gone. I've been set free. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. You're just chained to somebody. Else. But you're still, you're still. So think about that. Even in heaven, where sin will not exist, Yippee. what are you to do? To do the law. Except you get to do the law without original sin anymore. You get to do the yeah. law without yeah. you know messed up circumstances and the world of right. tyrants and and you know popes and things like that, right? Jesus said, "I have not come to do away with the law." So therefore, I like what he said. We're going to have the law in heaven, but yippee! <laughs> yeah. It's just a law without the the burden of right. the law, right? right. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, life is so good with Jesus that. They even would volunteer put a all through. Yeah, that's. I mean, when we talk about the uses play. of the law, right? It has purposes. You know, a curb, a mirror, and a guide. Okay, that third use, that guide. You only have the law as a guide. It's no longer a burden. It's a guidebook. How do I live? How do I live out this holy life? That's only a gospel response. You have to have first been forgiven to be able to get there. Okay. All right. Speaking of fear, which we weren't, but now we are again. <laughs> okay. Um, so today, fear is all too common among Christians, right? As I said, entire nations have been re revolving and making decisions around fear. And sure, it's not that they aren't justified, right? I'm not saying that there aren't things to be afraid of. But let's recognize what we are doing as a result of fear, okay? All right, all these varieties of fear are not the same. Though some fear is meat, right, and salutary, and some fear is not. What makes the difference? Where are you? Um, middle of page 13. Oh, okay. um, some fear is not is what I just finished with. And so I asked a question now, what makes the difference? What makes some fear good, what some fear bad? Julie? Uh, well, some of these that are listed here are the good kind of fear. They're the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. And where they're humble. I think Jacob was humble. Exactly. Jacob, right? He was he was fearful of God and awestruck, right? This was an awe-inspiring, a fear that directs us to God and his word and his promises, right? That's a good fear. And so is Mary. 
Yeah, the fear of hell is a good fear, right? <laughs> what should the fear of hell do for you? Drive you to your savior. <laughs> Drive you to your savior, yeah. Like, that's a good fear. It's very healthy for you. <laughs> you don't like being burned? Well, let's try not being burned eternally, right? That's a good fear, okay? Yeah. You know, these fears that were mentioned here, they're reasonable. Seems to me that we shouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. They all happened when a person noticed that, hey, I just met God. Or he's here, or he made me a promise, mm -hmm. or something or other. Uh -huh. And he's perfect, and I'm not. Yeah. And exactly. so then you have to say, gosh, I hope he doesn't notice that. Yeah. I'm afraid he will <laughs> notice how crooked I am. Yeah. Because I was thinking bad thoughts before I just, just before I noticed that God was there, I was thinking bad things. Even while he was there. Yeah. yeah. And so that would make you... Hold on, just for just a second. God. So following on that, what did Peter say? So this was from... Oh, you were going to ask this one? Well, no, I, I had a comment about Peter. So, well, this is Luke 5, 8 through 10. After Jesus orchestrated a miraculous catch of fist, Peter fell to his knees afraid and said... What did he say? Depart from me, I'm a wretched man. Oh. Yes, yes. Depart from me, for I am a wretched man or a sinful man. Right? Yeah. Peter, when he saw a miraculous catch of fish, what did he immediately do? He fell down in fear because he knew he did not deserve this. Yeah. yeah. If you watch The Chosen, they added their own little narrative to it, and it's because Peter was in debt, and he had no way of paying his debt, and so he was breaking the Sabbath to fish on the Sabbath so he could pay off his debt. And then Jesus gave him this miraculous catch of fish, and he paid off his debt. Yeah. That's uh, artistic license, right? They're adding, it's not that the Bible doesn't say that was true. It just doesn't say what it was or wasn't, right? Either way, it brought him to his knees, either figuratively or literally, right? He was convicted. He was convicted, yeah. So to say, with Peter also, though, when he was afraid when he was walking on the water towards Jesus, he became afraid when he took his eyes off mm -hmm. of Jesus. So he wasn't focusing on God anymore. He was focusing on everything else going on around him. Which Instead probably wasn't about. good. And and, yeah. and what's saying, really interesting, and saying, yeah, and yeah. I saying, and what's really interesting about that is he decided to fear creation more than the creator. More than the creator. He was again yeah, looking at those waves and all of a sudden. And he wasn't thinking that. He lost yeah. His yeah. So so it was really funny. Hope showed me this. There was this tattoo artist that she showed me last night. It's. Christian tattoo artist, and he's, he's commenting, he's like, I won't do certain tattoos. And one of these is apparently there's this thing called angel angel numbers, where it's like 111, 222, 333, 444, 555, 666, 777, 888, And all these angel numbers are supposed to like say something or do something or you know invoke this power. And, and every single one is fixated and and focused on created things We're instead of something for you yes yeah. yeah instead of the creator do you mean two 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 means something no it doesn't they just completely made it they did the literal complete made it up out of the out of the sky it's got no more validity than astrology signs it's, are you saying that someone believes that 222 two, two yes. means something? Yes. yes. And 333 three, three means something different. Yes. Oh, it went through what each individual uh, thing meant mm -hmm. or what it would do. Ironically, 666 six, was about, no, it was about giving you pleasure. No, it was also balance. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is an example, though, of how often we are more afraid of the created than the creator. Angels, even if you're fearing angels, you're still afraid of created things. Angels have more in common with you than with God. Yeah. You, have, you, and, you angels and frogs are in the same category. I'm sorry. That's true. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. They might be, you know, seemingly you know, immense, immeasurable power. Yes. 
heard nothing. I heard nothing. Compared to the creator. Yeah. People not being afraid of the creator. And we're like, oh, God will forgive me. It's okay. Is that because we've done too much of buddy Christ kind of thing? God loves everybody. He never gets angry instead of paying attention to when he does get angry. I think if you are in that state, then I question your faith, right? Yeah. Because true faith drives you back to God's word. Mm -hmm. And if you truly believe your Savior did this stuff for you, then you also truly believe that other the other things your savior said like i have not come to abolish the law or you know do unto others as i have done for you you know things like that yeah, yeah which we don't do <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so that's what makes the difference right some fear is godly some fear is not let's let's recognize that okay after calming the storm that caused his disciples to fear for their lives jesus turns to the real danger why are you so afraid have you still no faith? The Catechism rightly concludes or includes fear as the component of the faith the first commandment calls us to have. In fact, it's all the commandments. You should fear and love God so that. You should fear and love God so that, right? The first one just is you should fear, love, and trust in God of all things, right? Okay? Um, the first commandment calls us to have, but the fear Jesus rebukes is opposed to faith. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but the fear of anything else is the beginning of idolatry. Because idolatry is worshiping creation and not the creator. Right? Because you're changing yourself to something. <laughs> exactly. Good. Yeah. Good. Um, and there's, there's, like, you could even bear this out. Some psychologists have this fixation with why people believe in a God and how strange this is. And it seems so contrary. Why would anyone? And they, they claim that there's a part of our brain that needs to believe in something. Well, for those who don't believe in God, I would argue they're still believing in something, whether it's themselves or science or something else, right? Okay. After Jesus stills the storms, storm, sorry, his disciples fear shifts from their temporary predicament to their eternal one. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This exhortation to courage is not a call away from fear, but a call to proper fear. So when we say take courage, right, we're talking about looking at fear rightly. Courage is not the absence of fear. Some have said that courage is fear that has said its prayers. I prefer to say that courage is fear that has been baptized. Now keep in mind, he's the LCMS president. Why would he change it from fear that says its prayers to fear that's been baptized? What's the, what's the theological difference? It depends on who's doing what to who. When I pray, I'm praying to God that I'm doing something. Okay. When I'm baptized, I receive something from him. Okay. It's kind of, you're, you're kind of getting what I'm going for, yeah? Keep, keep, die, think, think about what is the purpose of the sacraments? Whether it's baptism or the Lord's Supper, what is the purpose? You receive forgiveness. Forgiveness. Create and strength and faith. Create strength and faith. Yeah. Why do we throw physical elements in there? So we're tactile and we can touch it. Yeah. To make it more concrete. Why do we define a sacrament as something ordained by God? Instituted. Instituted by God. Because we want to make it more concrete. The entire purpose of the sacraments is to remove any lingering doubt. Have you ever said a prayer and had a doubt? Oh, yeah. I don't know if God's going to answer that prayer, especially the way I want it to. Well, if you want answer it the way you want to. Have you ever seen a baptism and had a doubt? about whether God just forgave that child and started living huh. in that child's heart at that exact moment? Good point. <laughs> no. Unfortunately for prayer, is it doesn't have this real ironclad X, Y type of thing, right? It, it, it's kind of nebulous. Yes, God commands it. God promises to answer it and hear it. But, but we don't know how he's going to do it. And so it's, it feels a little less solid. 
Prayer is not a means of grace, though, either. It, it isn't, yeah. I, I, I got one. Once upon a time, and I bet John remembers this, and most of the people that were in the library, Bible study, so uh, Gary Thur and his wife were okay. in the Bible study. We were talking about prayer. And uh, he do not need to be a charismatic, them two. Because he said, every time my wife and I pray, whatever we pray about, we ask God to take those words and turn them into his perfect will, mm -hmm. and we're content. Mm -hmm. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. That was so edifying. To be and, and that's very true. That's, yeah. But you still don't know what his will is. No, correct. And that's the distinct difference, so right? What? With baptism, you know. Oh, okay. You know not only what has just happened, how it's happened, and what's going to happen, right? Because it's a concrete thing. But we only know that because he promised it. And that exactly, yeah. Me. And so fear, or courage, is fear that has been baptized. In other words, it's now sol solidly, concretely in God's word. His promise his gospel, his law. In other words, if it doesn't say it or proclaim it through the church, then you know that it's not a godly fear. In other words, courage, right? Courage is fear that has been baptized. In other words, it's been put through God's word, right? And so I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's why is he changing? And I'm not, by, by no means am I saying prayer should be belittled or anything. Prayer is an amazing, amazing gift. You know, if you want to talk about Luther's use of prayer, I would say he's a way better use of prayer than anyone in the Lutheran church today. And some of his recorded prayers are just astoundingly faithful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was weird. <laughs> and so it's, it's, by no means, I'm not belittling the use of prayer. I'm just saying in, in this understanding of courage, prayer leaves a little too much up to the, to the unknown. Whereas prayer that is, courage is fear that has been baptized makes it a lot more concrete. Okay? All right. Every crisis is temporary. There really is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9. Pandemics and plagues have come and gone throughout the millennium. Christ has sustained his church. When the bacteria-born black plague struck Wittenberg in Luther's day, he wrote a letter of counsel to a good friend. And many of you guys have probably already read this because um, Tom Burnison found it online and printed it off and had it posted in our narthex, like most of the pandemic, <laughs> okay? This is what Luther has to say about the Black Plague. Use medicine, take potions which can help you. If you ever get your house, yard, and street, shun persons and places wherever your neighbor does not need your presence or is recovered and act like a man who wants to help put out the burning city. What else is the epidemic but a fire which instead of consuming wood and straw devours life and body? You ought to think this way. Very well. By God's decree, the enemy has sent us poison and deadly offal. Therefore, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Yeah. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence if god should wish to take me he will surely find me and i have done what he has expected of me and so i am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others if my neighbor needs me however i should not avoid place or person but will go freely see this is such a god-fearing faith because it is neither because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. Now he skipped a, a chunk there, that dot, dot, dot. For the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go through it all. But he goes through much the same. And the idea that he goes through in there is the exceptions to these things are when your Christian vocation calls you to be in these arenas. Like, for example, should a doctor avoid someone who's sick? Probably not. Their Christian vocation is to take care of that person who's sick, right? The mayor shouldn't flee the city. Yeah, the mayor shouldn't flee the city. Yep. All these different things. Luther even said, I'm not going to flee because the city needs me right here. You know, But other, other people, you should probably flee. <laughs> so, and so the, the reality is he ties it back into our vocation, our, our God-given task in this created life. Okay? 
Luther says he would go freely because he decided to remain in the city and provide spiritual care even as his parishioners, dear friends, and loved ones died. Today, medical professionals place themselves in danger to serve those with contagious illnesses. Okay, so this is, you know, he says every crisis is temporary. The point he's trying to make here is that even this huge fear, the pandemic, is nothing new. It's not like God hasn't seen these things before, you know. And so the church itself hasn't, is, isn't anything new in its experience to this stuff as well. And so you shouldn't just be afraid. No, you should turn to God and ask what you should do according to his work, right? Any questions on that? Okay. Our current troubles point us to eternity. Luther most likely wrote our favorite Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, around 1527, during the plague. Temporary, tempor, temporal tragedy points us to eternal hope and consolation. Jesus foretold what we see. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. We see such things now. Great fear has spread across the globe. Confusion abounds. The church is stressed and pressed. LCMS pastors have been in deep distress as parishioners died in hospital quarantine, cut off from the spiritual care. Virtually all of us have had to forego gathering as the church, receiving the sacrament from our pastors, only in small groups or not at all. Many of us have, have, been, have been deeply troubled by governments mandating things even within our sanctuaries. Jesus also reassures us. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. We have been redeemed, paid for by Christ's death on the cross, and declared righteous by his resurrection. Oh, I'm sorry, I just lost my voice. By his resurrection, we anxiously await the redemption of our bodies, that is, the resurrection of our bodies, to live with Christ for eternity. We do not cower, least of all, in the face of a pandemic, Straighten up, says Jesus. Lift up your heads. Surely I am coming soon. The crisis defines our task today. I'm worried. I'm forever self-centered. I'm a sinner. Crisis move me to re crises move me to repentance. Thank God I'm forgiven. But not all fear is sinful. It's not sinful to run and get out of the way of a tornado or an, or an oncoming train. We are using our God-given smarts when we wisely follow the advice of medical authorities. How shall I live now? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20 As Luther acted during the plague, and as he once said, The need of my neighbor is my call to mercy. What is my vocation? I shall honor government officials. Fourth commandment. Specifically, as they ask and require me to act responsibly regarding my own health and that of the others. Fifth commandment. But not where government dictates matters of faith, where I'm called to serve others, even at some risk to myself. Luther left this decision to the individual conscience. So shall I do, trusting that God is my helper and that I'm in his hands. I shall do my best to demonstrate love to others, especially to my family and the friends God has given me. I shall be generous in my prayers for all. Especially, for my, especially my pastors, church workers, and congregation. I shall pray for those in authority. When I cannot gather with others for worship, I shall concentrate on the word of God. I shall continue to be generous in my stewardship and a blessing to the mission of my congregation and synod so that others may know Christ. Crisis, is, crisis forces us to ask, how shall we act when it's over? So, for example... In the midst of a crisis, whether it's a pandemic or maybe something more near term, like the election. <gasps> right? The election. If the other party wins, then the whole country is going to go down in a drain. What does that crisis say about some foundational questions? Who is Christ? Mm -hmm. Is he sovereign? Yeah. What does the church mean in our lives? How are we relating to our families? Are we living lives of fear or of joyfulness in Christ's abundant gifts? 
what have we learned about our congregation and community, right? Sometimes fear brings out the best of people, and sometimes fear brings out the worst of people, right? And so sometimes it's that test of faith can really help give you a, a metric of where you stand, right? What have we learned about reaching out? What renewed or new appreciation do we have for our congregation, right? There's a crisis, and I guarantee you some people, like, for example, remember that I wasn't here yet, but I've been told the Chittix had lightning strike their house like six or seven years ago or something like that. And what did the congregation do? Help them. Didn't abandon them. It supported them, right? Yep. When Mike and I, about 2019, our big log house was at the base of a rather steep hill, mountain. And we had a torrential hail and rain. I mean, it was a torrential, it was a downpour. It just broke loose. And it rushed down that mountain with such force that it tore out the mountain above us. It was just hail and water, slammed into our house, filled our basement, destroyed everything in the basement, went on around, tore out pastors, and tore out the driveway in about 13 minutes. Mm. And it was like, Oh my goodness. So our first reaction was, well, thanks be to God, we're not hurt. And our house is still standing, but boy, do we have a mess. We lived 40 miles and another time zone and a mountain pass away from our church. And that very next day, a whole bunch of those guys came down with scoop shovels and brooms and started mucking out. And we were just in a state of shock. It was like, I'm you're, you're like an automaton, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. The, the Christians do for each other. Yeah. We do. And sometimes crisis is, it is almost godsend because it yeah. suddenly allows us to do something that we haven't had the chance to do yet, right? Mm -hmm. It allows us the, the opportunity to assist our neighbor. And I know that can sound very kind of like, almost mean spirit in the sense of, oh, I'm so happy that you had this horrible thing happen, right? Because I got a chance to use a chainsaw. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. No, no. And I don't mean like that, but, but there is a reality to that, right? Okay. Other questions of crisis. What have we learned about caring for one another within the, oh, we already said that one. Sorry. Is our congregation really caring for its pastors and workers? What have we learned about the blessing of being in this together as the LCMS? Have we found strength in the found fundamental teachings of the catechism? What have we learned from the scriptures about faith and life? And how might we work together with nearby LCMS congregations for the sake of the gospel? How might we prepare, better prepare for the next crisis? Even as you think through some of these things, count on the fact that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And for those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And for that reason, we can dare in Christ be confident that we shall be stronger for passing through crisis, stronger together. So we'll stop there. But uh, that final verse, though, I would argue is often used wrongly. It's used to say, oh, see, this is going to turn out good, and you're going to be so happy, and, and you know, life is just going to be better. That's not what the verse says. When it says that for those who love God, that all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, it doesn't say for your good. It's for the good of the gospel, for the good of the church. Perhaps your crisis is the thing that brings someone to faith. You might suffer. You might never get any good out of that crisis. But you might have just saved a soul because you suffered in faith. Yeah. And so it's, it's hard, right? Because we always want to take this in the positive. But let's not, let's not put a context to God's word that doesn't exist. It doesn't say that this is going to be positive. For you specifically and me. It will be positive for the church. God's will will be done. Our creator will win, right? You know, that, that, that's all good. 
But you might have to be the suffering servant for that to happen. Well, you want to name it and claim it, Pastor. I'm, <laughs> I know. I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> you know, that's so true because after that event happened to us, <clears throat> we being we and who we are, so many people were just so almost shocked that we were just wallowing <clears throat> in tears and moping and what. It was, you know, it was, uh, it was a testimony of our faith. We didn't think about it in those terms. As she said, you were just shocked. <laughs> but, we, but the fact that we were thanking God, we, we still had a house and we weren't hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, so what if, the, if it was destroyed? Did it come out pretty good in the long run? Um, it happened again the, the next May. Well, that's, go, that's why we got them, <laughs> is because they got tired of getting flooded. <laughs> We have to share our testimony oh, yeah. with you sometime. <laughs> but we, uh, it, we knew that, you know, these things do happen. They are tests of faith. They are meant to bring maybe somebody to God. You just don't know. Yeah. And you're right. That house that we live in now, I had seen it when it was under construction. Driving around with my sister, we were going to move down here, but we were going to buy land and build. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, we got crashed again in May. In July, that house that we live in went on the market, and I bought it sight unseen. Mm -hmm. I made an offer on the life. Mm -hmm. And here we are. It was a God thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, it really was. Yeah. And now, yes, and house now house for the good of the gospel, you get to deal with your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're praying. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't hate it. We yeah, just, no, it's no, I didn't say that. No, <laughs> I just say there's an example of this verse not necessarily being for our personal good, right? <laughs> All right. With that, I know we've kind of got a little long. Um, I, I the the next one is kind of a similar length, but part of the reason why the book is going to be helpful is once we get into the kind of the main portion of the book. Some, some of these are like just two pages long. Some of them are four pages long. In fact, I think there's one section that's five pages long. Most of these are very short. They're, they're more like devotional blips, okay? Cool. They, they threw it, throw in a concept, throw something out there, and then we'll kind of talk about it. Okay, so that's why having it just so we can kind of look at it will be a little bit easier, okay? And no, you don't have to buy it. But. <laughs> Um, any final comments or questions for me? Okay. Well, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have blessed us today. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to make us courageous for you, to make our fear one that returns us always to you and to the sacrifice of salvation Jesus has given for us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.